So not only does exercise reduce your risk of breast cancer by 50% if you exercise every day for 30 minutes, it also reduces your risk, of course, of heart disease and various other cancers. It reduces your risk of cognitive decline. The Mayo Clinic proceedings say, in fact, that if you exercise regularly, it is the most powerful reducer with regards to the risk of dementia over time. So why do you not want to be active? I am very pleased to be here with Dr. Stefan Esser. He is a fourth generation plant-based physician uh, who is very passionate about healthy living. Uh, he's actually a incredibly smart guy. He was educated at Harvard and the Mayo Clinic, and he specializes in teaching people how to use their lifestyle as medicine. Uh, he's also a sports medicine doctor and has, we're going to be talking a lot about exercise today, the benefits, but more importantly, how you can actually get started and how you can make this a part of your overall lifestyle because just having the information isn't always good enough. Uh, Stefan and his wife offer in-person and online education and inspiration to help people move from a state of survival to a state of thriving. So you can learn more about them at esserhealth.com. That's E-S-S-E-R health.com and essersports.com. Dr. Esser, how are you doing today? Cyrus, I'm rocking it. I'm so excited to be here with you and uh, excited to share this message of health, vitality, and exercise with your people. This is great. This is great, actually. You know, quick backstory here. Um, when we were preparing um, for interviews for the next year, I asked a lot of my coaches, I said, hey, uh, who are some new personalities and some new people that I could interview uh, that we haven't already had on the podcast? And I let 24 hours go by and then I checked the thread and it was like, Dr. Esser, Dr. Esser, Dr. Esser, Dr. Stefan, Dr. Stefan. And I was like, whoa, this is like an overwhelming uh, you know, response from people. So uh, you clearly have made quite a, uh, a name for yourself. And I think that the energy and the, the, the information that you bring to the table has definitely resonated with a lot of people. Well, I mean, it's such an exciting message to share, right? I mean, who who cannot relate to health and vitality? Who doesn't want to be more vital, more healthy? As the poet said, right, health is the first wealth and that foundational piece we all want. So it's, you know, I'm just excited to be, you know, the bearer of good news that what we do matters. Uh, what does it mean when you say you're a fourth generation plant-based physician? There are literally three generations above you that were all plant-based. That is correct. So my great grandfather uh, had some health concerns, and at the time they lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he started reading the writings of Father Joseph Kneipp, who is a Catholic priest in Germany, who had developed this whole program of eating fruits and vegetables and water, and uh, doing you know uh, cryo baths, etc. And he essentially would you know cure people of their various diseases. And they had these little Kneipp Wasser cure clinics all through Germany and parts of Germany. And so he was reading these books, and I still have some of those books now from the 1800s. And he said, you know what? We need to eat better. And they moved outside of Pittsburgh and started growing some of their own fruits and vegetables and eating plants and got healthy. And it was a result of that experience that my grandfather, Dr. William Lesser, uh, was motivated to go into naturopathic and chiropractic college at the Manhattan, uh, you know, kind of Institute of Chiropractic back in the 19, I guess it'd be 1520s, somewhere in there. And, uh, and then as a result of that, he started Esther's Ranch and for 65 years ran this fasting and th therapeutic water detox facility where people from all over the world would come. And for 65 years, he hosted about 30 people at a time in South Florida, um, all the way until he was 90. So people would come on this 10 acre parcel with an organic mango farm and organic uh, produce grown there and, uh, and get well. And so, yeah, it's, this has been a legacy from them uh, down to me, and uh, which is so cool for all your viewers to remember that this may be they're putting the post down in the sand. They're saying, this is the beginning of something new for my family for the next 10, 20, 30 generations. Like that, that can be their decision that they make now, which is so cool. Yeah, it's a crazy thought actually, because uh, most people who I interact with who have adopted a plant-based lifestyle, even a lot of the experts are like, yeah, I started in 2015, I started in 2010, you know, and I'm like, all right, cool, sweet, that's great. You know, you have like five, six, ten, seven, ten 10 years under your belt. But to hear that you have multiple generations before you, is truly unique. So that's actually really cool to hear. 
And I think it's such a reminder, right, that the decisions that you and I make today may seem or feel like they're just for ourselves, our own personal health. But the reality is we are laying down, like I said, this legacy for future generations, not only in our own personal and societal health, but of course, as we know, for the planetary positive effects and of course, for the good of animals, et cetera. But it's just such a beautiful thing to think that when you choose what to put on that fork uh, or how to move, you are making decisions that have radical ripple effects for generations to come. Amen to that. And I would also say that, you know, you have ripple effects on the people that you currently live with and spend time with. Because you see this story all over the place where, you know, a uh, mother of three kids living with husband in one household decides that she wants to make a change. So she starts to adopt different lifestyles. Um, she's, you know, changing her exercise regimen. She's changing the food that she eats. And then as a result of that, the husband has no choice but to also participate and the kids have no effect or, or, or no choice but to also participate. So you end up with this ripple effect right there within that one household and then that can spread to you know other friends and family and then down the road over the course of time to other generations. So um, what I want to talk about today is actually exercise, exercise, exercise because you know I love exercise. It's like my number one favorite job in the world and I've been you know an, a an, an avid athlete ever since I was a little kid. Um, and I know you are also extremely active as well. Um, so what I want to talk about is like, why exercise, right? Why exercise? But more importantly, I think people understand, generally speaking, from an intellectual perspective, they're like, okay, great. My doctor told me to do diet and exercise. You're telling me to do exercise. I get it. I'm supposed to exercise. But yet a tiny fraction of the population actually exercises. So what, let's, I don't know, let's start at the top and maybe you can explain to us like, why exercise? You know, there are two major pillars of human health and they're going to be, that are directly in our control. And that's going to be the nutrients that we consume and the movement that we get on a regular basis. And all too often people put themselves in one camp or another camp. They say, well, I'm the kind of guy that exercises or I'm the kind of girl that just eats well. And that's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's enough. <laughs> I don't have the, uh, you know, kind of the bandwidth to do both. When the reality is that they go hand in glove together to create this vital health that we all want. The micronutrient-dense plant-based foods radically reverse and reduce the risk of many chronic diseases. But it is the movement, the therapeutic movement that we do on a daily basis that maintains our function and our performance and our ability to, to function at peak. So, you know, you can load those trucks up with healthy food, but if the, you're not moving them down the highway, they're not going anywhere. And so we've got to get our bodies moving in order to maximize our health span, right? This concept that we want to live a vital life for decades to come so that we are vital and able to, right? I mean, I say to people all too often, the goal here is not to enter into a cult the goal is not to count the number of micronutrient, you know, doses of quercetin that you ate from your red onions or, you know, the amount of sulforaphane from your, you know, broccoli. The goal here is to eat well so you're healthy and you can then go out and be the best version of you. Whether that be as a mother, a father, a cousin, an uncle, right? Whether that be as a janitor, as a lawyer, as a doctor, as an athlete, as a whatever it might be that you're passionate about, the, the vision that you have for your own life to live this vital life. But movement is going to maximize your potential to be active and strong for decades to come. And without it, you're going to end up losing muscle mass. You're going to lose flexibility. You're going to lose reaction time. These things will be lost over time if you don't work on them. And so it's not a matter of whether you like exercise or not. It's a matter of do you want to be able to do things and live a vital life? And if you do, then exercise has to be that foundational piece to your success. Okay. I love this. This is, uh, is amusing to my ears. Uh, talk to me about uh, how much, what type. Oftentimes, I think people interpret the idea of exercise as though it is work. I got to put on my shoes. I got to go to the gym. I got to do this class. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it. I'm going to sweat. I'm going to get out of breath. It's going to burn. This sucks. Right. Right. Then you have other people who are like, oh, no, I'm active. I'm super active. I just go on a walk around the block and I do that once or yeah. twice a day. Right. So like help me understand, like 
what does the term exercise and living an active lifestyle actually mean? I think the first place for people to start, especially those that are new to exercise, is to ask the basic question, why do you not want to be active? Right? Is it because you have a bad experience as a kid? Is it because you have an injury? Is it because it feels uncomfortable? Is it because you don't know where to start? Is it because you lack time? Is it because of finances? Is it because you don't you feel alone in this? Right? Whatever it might be. Is it because well, gosh, when you were in sixth grade, the girls made fun of you on the playground because you were overweight, right? Or you couldn't, you know, walk around the lap, you know, in the physical exercise, you know, during class time, during recess, you couldn't even get around the lap without being out of breath, and people made fun of you. You know, what was it? But often we have these wounds and as a result, we have these connotations of what we think of when we think of exercise. Like you suggested, we think of putting on pink spandex, going to a place we hate and sweating next to people we don't like. And that's not what it's all about. We need to break it down and start saying, no, this is actually about physical activity. That's number one. We can get rid of the word exercise if, it's, if it threatens us and instead use the word physical activity because it may in fact be that the health benefits we want can be obtained right there in our living room barefoot, right? Watching a fun YouTube video or just doing 20 quick squats, 20 countertop pushups and a few jumping jacks, right? And a few little slow stretches that that's going to be of some value to us. And it's the sort of entry zone for getting our body moving more. But the reality is we can break down exercise into two or three major categories. There's going to be this physical activity that is cardiovascular benefit. There is going to be strength training. There's going to be flexibility and there's going to be balance. These four factors are crucial for your long-term success. So not only does exercise reduce the risk of breast cancer by 50% if you exercise every day for 30 minutes, crazy. It also reduces your risk, of course, of heart disease and various other cancers. It reduces your risk of cognitive decline. The Mayo Clinic proceedings say, in fact, that if you exercise regularly, it is the most powerful reducer with regards to the risk of dementia over time. Very impressive. Not only that, of course, we have all kinds of intangibles. When you exercise, you reduce your risk of falls. You reduce your risk of depression equally as though you're taking Prozac. I mean, if you exercise 30 minutes a day, it is as effective for moderate depression as Prozac is. Studies showing this, randomized controlled trials. So if you struggle with anxiety, is as effective as benzodiazepines. This is the sort of stuff we want to remind ourselves is that truly exercise is medicine in a very positive way for our bodies. But so, you know, all of that being said, there also are intangible effects of exercise. It increases self-efficacy, the belief that you can do something. If you can walk around the block three times every morning for a week, you'll start getting more confidence. And now when you go, oh, I need to eat the salad. Well, guess what? If you can walk around the block, you can eat the salad, right? You start getting more confidence in yourself and more self-belief. In addition, studies show for kids, right? It reduces the risk of ADD and ADHD. It increases scores on tests for those kids that exercise on a regular basis, get that physical activity in. So in addition, what? When you exercise, you have better bowel movements. The studies show this, right? The list just goes on and on. For older people, they have lower risks of falls. They have less risk of hip fracture and knee fractures. You know, it's all of this. It's just the evidence for exercise is amazing. And it's for every age, for every major problem, exercise is beneficial. So long story short is the right exercise, the right place to start is where you're willing to start. Is that cardiovascular? Is that strength training? Is that resistance or is that balance? We need to start somewhere. Okay. That's a great answer. But, uh, let me ask you this. If somebody decides that they want to start with cardiovascular exercise, usually because it's the easiest, it's the lowest barrier to entry. All I got to do is put on some shoes that are somewhat comfortable and then just walk out my front door and then I can go. So what most people will do, especially if you're maybe in your 40s or 50s or 60s and it's been a while since you've been using your body, so put on some shoes and they'll start walking, right? And they'll go for a walk. Maybe it'll be like a 20-minute walk and then maybe a 30-minute walk. Then maybe they'll bring the dog. Maybe they'll grab some friends and they'll use that just sort of continuous movement. Uh eventually, maybe it might get to doing some resistance exercise. But oftentimes I've experienced with people that it might take years for them to get to that point. 
because they just kind of get into this, this habit of using walking as their primary mode of exercise. So let me ask you that. If, if somebody decided that they wanted to do that and they wanted to just walk around the block, maybe like, well, you know, sorry, walk for 20 minutes once a day, is that enough to begin with? Or should they be focusing on adding multiple forms of exercise, the cardiovascular, the resistance, the balance, and uh, the flexibility all simultaneously in order to get those powerful effects that you just described? It depends on the individual. For those individuals who are coming in gung-ho, ready to rock with no sort of, um, they don't feel limited. They don't feel overwhelmed by this. Sure. If you're ready to get in there and you're willing to do cardio two days or three days per week and resistance training two days a week and flexibility and balance every evening or every morning, Hey, let's rock this together. But if you're feeling overwhelmed, well, let's start somewhere, but let's not stop there. Let's make sure that you are setting what we call smart goals. So that's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely, right? So that you, instead of just saying, well, I'm going to start walking, that's not it. It needs to be, I'm going to start walking Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 a.m. for 30 minutes to the point that I'm a little bit out of breath while I'm walking. And I'm going to do that for the next three weeks. And then I'm going to start adding in squats lunges and some countertop push-ups, let's say if you don't have access to a gym, or you're going to start a nice gym workout if you're not comfortable with starting on your own, having a personal trainer for the first month to get you going. But we do want to remember, while walking is a great way to get some movement and to see the neighborhood and maybe to relax a little bit, it does not provide the full therapeutic benefits that we want for people long term. It will not build the muscles the way that we need and want, nor will it build the bones in a healthy fashion, especially for women over the age of 30 who are dealing with what's called both sarcopenia, which is age-related muscle loss, and then osteopenia, this bone density loss that occurs as women age past 35. We need the resistance training for these. Okay. That's, that's great to hear actually, because resistance training has actually become my primary mode of exercise. I freaking love it. Um, but I understand that it can also be kind of daunting to get into because if you don't know what to do, you don't know how to do it. And, or maybe you have a previous track record of getting injured when you do resistance exercise, it can just be flat out intimidating. So, uh, when you say resistance exercise, are you talking about lifting weights, is that necessary? Or can you just use your body as uh, its own resistance uh, against gravity? So I think for individuals who are quite flexible and have been athletic back in their past and are still relatively athletic, they can get amazing workouts starting with just their body weight. But for an individual who's relatively new to kind of some modes of resistance training, I think in order to maximize their success and reduce the risk of injury, that machines are a great place to start and or light weights with a trainer who can guide them through good form, good techniques, so they're not damaging their joints. But if you go, for example, on machinery and you're starting with five upper body and five lower body exercises, high rep sets of 15 to 30 reps, two sets, and then you're building up progressively, adding more weight over the next several weeks, you should have a beautiful both anatomic response with the muscles becoming a little bit more hypertrophy, stronger, leaner, more toned, and the bones responding with some bone density improvements. In addition, studies done at the uh, one of the anti-aging institutes Fred, by the NIH in California demonstrated that just eight weeks of regular resistance exercise would reverse the aging of the individual at the muscle level by up to 30%. If you just did resistance training for about eight weeks, you improved mitochondrial function, energy production, and you reduced inflammation at the cellular level. I mean, that's beautiful. And so we know that, for example, with diabetes, diabetes accelerates aging at the cellular level, right? Especially if the blood sugars are not adequately maintained with chronic inflammation going up. And so exercise can be a potent and powerful way to have a positive effect, reducing inflammation and decreasing the progression of aging at the cellular level. But in order to get the maximum anatomic and physiologic benefits, we need real weight. We need to be pushing something significant to really reverse, for example, osteopenia and the effects of sarcopenia over time. Yeah. Okay. I like where you're going with this one, actually, because you're basically saying that you can use body weight resistance as sort of a bridge to getting to a point where you're actually using external weight. And then that external weight is actually what's going to give you the full therapeutic benefit because you're going to get the cardiovascular on one side, 
and then you're going to get the weight bearing resistance exercise on the other. And that's going to give you a much stronger effect than either one in isolation or resistance exercise with no weight. So you're a sports medicine doctor, and I'm sure you've probably seen thousands of patients over the course of time. So tell me in your clinic, what do you see? What types of injuries do you see? And, and how does weight bearing resistance exercise fit into your philosophy? Are you prescribing that for people to actually use as a rehab mechanism to become more active and stay more active? So for the last 12 years in practice, I averaged about 6,000 patient visits a year. So a lot of people seen in clinic. And these individuals would come in for complaints, everything from the top of the head to the bottom of the toes, knee pain, shoulder pain, hip pain, neck pain, back pain, ankle pain, you name it. And the reality of what we know based on the scientific literature in the sports medicine world is that balancing muscles across joints significantly reduces the risk of injury and degeneration. So to give you an example, if you have well-balanced quad strength and hamstring strength, you slow progression of arthritis in your knees. If you have well-balanced pec strength and posterior shoulder strength, you decrease the risk of cervical degeneration and of glenohumeral arthritis in your shoulder, right? And so there is this clear correlation between good, well-maintained muscular strength across our body and the risk of degenerative change. This makes total sense when you think of the mechanical aspect of the body. Just like your car, if your car's tires are well balanced and aligned, then you don't wear down the tread as quickly. But if the alignment of the tires is off, then the tread is going to wear down more rapidly. And in addition, you're going to wear down the other superstructures of the vehicle. So if I use therapeutic exercise in the form of physical therapy and strength training as a primary modality to help people recover from injury and to prevent injury long term. It's almost like there's, there's nothing that exercise can't do. That's the way that I like to think of it. You know, I've told myself that from a really young age that exercise is almost like the global panacea. And the truth is that, you know, whatever, that's just hyperbole. Um, but there are so many health benefits that come along for the ride, right? Um, like you were saying, there's benefits for your brain. There's benefits for your eyes. There's benefits for your for your cardiovascular tissue. There's benefits for your heart muscle, peripheral blood vessels, your liver, your kidney, and the list goes on. So maybe let's get a little geeky here for a second. Um, talk to me about some of the cellular mechanisms specifically for people living with diabetes, right? Diabetes is a condition where there's multiple symptoms. Either you have high blood glucose or you have insufficient insulin production from your pancreas or you have a significant buildup of intramyocellular and intrahepatic uh, lipid you know, inside of your muscle and inside of your liver. So um, if somebody with diabetes is going to start exercising, and let's say they do some combination of cardiovascular exercise and maybe a little bit of weight training, right? What's actually going on under the hood that's enabling them to improve their blood glucose control and beyond? I think you just already gave away the uh, the sneak peek, right? By saying those three, the different mechanisms or the Damn types it. of uh, <laughs> diabetes, right? Which is great. Uh, but that's the reality, right? Is whether you're doing, the studies show whether you're doing cardiovascular resistance training, number one is you're using up your free blood sugars, right? You're immediately taking out of the bloodstream the glucose that's there because the body needs it for energy, right? For the muscles. So right away, you're dropping the blood sugars out of the, from the bloodstream level. Number two, you're beginning to use up the stored blood sugars in the form of glycogen that's either in the muscle or in the liver. And number three, you reduce the risk and likelihood of fat being stored in the liver, right, which increases that risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH and also throws off blood sugar control and management, et cetera. So you're, in addition, the studies show that when you exercise regularly, you, you improve the efficiency of your insulin. So the insulin is almost supercharged to be able to more effectively transfer the blood sugar out of the bloodstream and into the muscles more quickly where it can work more rapidly and just be, it supercharges it, right? It's, it's, it's just as good or better than taking some medication like metformin or the like that kind of enhances insulin sensitivity. Exercise does that for you. 
So it drops resting blood sugars, improves insulin sensitivity, decreases insulin, in, uh, insulin inhibition as a result of reducing lipid storage, et cetera. So it's just at every level, it is enhancing your health and decreasing the negative effects of your uh, chronic inflammation related to elevated blood sugars and making you need less insulin, right? Whether you're type one, type two, type one and a half, three, et cetera, right? It's, just, it's enhancing the efficiency of your body. So you need less insulin when you are exercising on a regular basis. So it's, yeah, absolutely 100% a win. In addition, let's not forget that two of the major, three of the major complications we talk about, actually four with diabetes include, it increases your risk of a heart attack by 200 to 600%. It is the number one cause of blindness, number one cause of amputation, number one cause of neuropathy, number one cause of kidney failure in America. And so when you exercise, you reduce the risk of all of those things, right? Because when you're exercising, you drop your total cholesterol and your LDL you reduce generalized chronic inflammation, you improve cardiac efficiency, you improve blood flow to the nerves, right? Which decreases the risk of neuropathy and because you're delivering oxygen and delivering nutrition. Uh, and then you also are reducing your risk of renal insufficiency because you enhance kidney function through gentle, regular exercise. Um, and, you know, it's just like magic dust. Like you said, it's fantastic. And exactly what every single person, both with and without diabetes needs to do every single day, kind of checking the list of, did I get my movement in today? If I didn't, well, I'm going to do it right here in my living room. Even if I can't get out of the house, I'm going to do 15, 20 minutes of something that gets my blood flowing. It's such a crazy thought to think that just by moving your body, just by, you know, uh, doing squats or push-ups or pull-ups or uh, lunges or sit-ups or some combination of all that, or going outside, walking, jogging, riding your bike, that you're, you're mechanically using your limbs and you're using your shoulders and your back and your abs and your chest, and you're using the muscles to actually create movement, that that movement translates to improvements for tissues that have nothing to do with movement right? It improves the health of your liver and your liver is not involved in the exercise process. It's not doing anything necessarily to help your muscles move. Same thing with your kidney, same thing with your brain, right? They're all active and operating, but they're not actually participating in the work that's required during exercise. So it's kind of like this incredible benefit that comes along for the passengers of the car, even though the actual, the machine that's, that's creating the movement is primarily muscle bone and connective tissue. So on that note, explain to us just a little bit more about kidney health, because you just mentioned that regular exercise can actually significantly improve kidney health, right? Um, let's go into a little bit more detail about that because kidney health is becoming a much bigger issue in today's world. And, you know, uh, people who are living with di diabetes, one of the primary complications over the course of time is degenerating kidneys and increasing the risk of chronic kidney disease and eventually dialysis. So what happens to your kidneys when you're actually moving your body? Great question. So the kidneys, as you well know, right, are important because they're filtering out our blood and they are made up of all of these tiny little membranes, very delicate membranes, uh, maybe similar to almost like tissue paper, with millions and millions of little layers of you know wet tissue paper together with all of these little tubules, we call them. And along the length of these little hoses or tubules, these little hoses, uh, you know, water, salts, you know, different types of electrolytes are being passed back and forth as the body determines how much salt to hold on to, how much water to hold on to, how much all the different balances of these electrolytes. And that's being influenced at the kidney lever level. So a couple different things can radically influence the health of your kidneys. If you have elevated blood pressure, that it puts excess chronic demand and pressure onto these little tiny fibers of these little tubules. And just like with tissue paper, if you blow too hard on the tissue paper, you can break it. Well, the chronic pressure from the blood going in there at a high, you know, systolic level can damage the fibers of these tubules. And as a result, you can get scar tissue instead of having nice, delicate, light, uh, you know, I think about it like your kitchen sponge. You got that kitchen sponge on your sink. And when it's brand new, it gets the water and you can squeeze it right out. It's so healthy. But if you've used it for several weeks, it starts getting kind of crusty and hardened with all the crud on it. Uh, well, that's what can happen to our kidneys over time. And now they don't work as well to efficiently absorb and release fluid. And 
So if you have elevated blood pressure as a result of poor diet, lack of exercise, excess salt consumption, yeah, et cetera, um, you know, excess alcohol consumption, what we know and chronic stress, what we know is that's going to put increased pressure through the kidneys and over time it's going to damage the kidneys, which leads to then kidney dysfunction. Uh, number two along that same line is if you develop atherosclerosis, which is of course clogging up of the arteries or along the lining of your arteries, that by itself is going to increase the pressure in your bloodstream and increase damage on the kidneys, just like we spoke of. So for example, if you're running well water through your pipes all day, you're going to get crust along the pipes of your house. Well, if you're eating the standard American diet and you're consuming you know, pizza, French fries, and Mickey D's, and Chick-fil-A, and haagen dazs that is essentially creating a crust along the lining of your arteries, and that makes your arteries less uh, kind of adaptable to pressure and stress. And the pressure then goes up, which increases the pressure into the kidneys and again, damages the delicate tubules and leads to scarring and dysfunction. And, you know, so the, in addition, as you get um, increased atherosclerosis, you decrease perfusion to the kidney, meaning it can't even get enough blood in there. Uh, and as a result, it's almost like a pump trying to, you know, suck something dry and it's not getting enough fluid in there. And again, it causes injury to the kidney. In addition, of course, the chronically elevated blood sugars themselves can lead to glycosylation injury to the kidney, which makes these fibers and tubules not function as well. So there are multiple levels by which when we exercise, we improve the flexibility of our blood vessels so they can adapt uh, opening and closing, dilating and constricting more readily. They can respond to stress and pressure. They can also relax more completely. So our blood pressures on average are lower. Uh, in addition, when we're exercising regularly, we improve generalized perfusion to the tissues. Um, and then as we mentioned, exercise decreases overall total body weight, decreases resting lipids and decreases chronic inflammation. So, and decreases resting blood sugars. So all of these decrease the risk to the kidneys themselves and allow the kidney to be more efficient long-term. Now, when you combine that with a micronutrient-dense plant-based program, like what you, you know, advise your participants to eat, this is just a win-win for the kidneys and helps maintain their health longer and reducing that risk of kidney impairment, kidney failure, uh, and the need for dialysis, which we want to protect people from. That was a that was an unbelievable description. That that was vividly clear, especially the, the the visual of that crusty sponge, which when it's wet, it's nice and supple and it's 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 easy to use. And then you stick it on your sink and it dries up, and all of a sudden it becomes nice and crusty. So thank you for doing that. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper here into kidney health because, like you're saying, there's a very strong connection between using your body and improving your kidney health, which I freaking love. That's incredible. But a lot of the people who we talk with have been told that because they already have a struggling kidney or a kidney that's been become inflamed and they either are living with uh, chronic kidney disease stage one or stage two or stage three, now they're on multiple dietary restrictions. They're told to limit their phosphorus intake, their sodium intake, and their potassium intake. And so that right there eliminates so many different plant-based foods because what we're telling people to do is eat more fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains because that's gonna significantly improve your health. But yet their kidney doctor is saying, whoa, 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 hold on a second. I'm trying to lower your phosphorus intake and lower your sodium intake and lower your potassium intake. And if you try and achieve that, then that means that the world of plant-based food all of a sudden becomes really small and it's really hard to achieve. So uh, how, how do you solve that problem? W what would be your recommendations for you know, somebody that's been told to limit their plant food intake? That's a great question. And I see that all the time with patients who are in considering a transitioning to a healthy plant-based program. Um, and the reality is, unfortunately, I think that there are two voices in the room and they are somewhat at odds with each other, somewhat in conflict. And you know, the reality is when one looks at the statistics with regards to type one, type two, type one and a half diabetes, and progression to renal failure, the standard uh, approach of eating the standard American diet and just using medications is, is a failure. And on average, the, these people progressively see their renal function decline and unfortunately are then told, well, we did everything we could, now it's time for dialysis. 
And I hate to say this, but obviously that is just a moneymaker for so many doctors because at sixty to seventy thousand dollars per person per chair going to dialysis, these renal doctors have no reason to want to get patients better. And I hate to say that, but there is a vested interest that is kind of dark in the background. When we look at individuals who move into a micronutrient dense, largely protein low, low fat, plant based program like you advocate, what we see is on average, the majority of those individuals have improved renal function and are able to move away from many of the medications that were compromising their kidneys to begin with, and as a result, have improved health and move away from the cliff of dialysis. But I've seen it time and time again, we put people on four to six weeks of a micronutrient-dense plant-based program like I advocate and you do as well, and their renal function improves. People with chronic renal disease stage two and even stage three beautifully moving in a very positive direction. Uh, so I think you know, it's a, it's a challenge for people who hear this message to go, well, wait a second, I'm not allowed those foods. And what I would encourage for those that are especially nervous or concerned is to go slowly and to work with your people, right? To guide them through that process with appropriate, you know, testing and making sure that everything looks good and their numbers are staying where they need to stay and appropriate modifications are being made nutritionally and medication wise. Yeah, that's brilliant actually. Uh, it's, it's frustrating actually for the patient because they have two different voices in their head and they're trying to figure out, should I go left? Should I go right? Should I go left? Should I go right? And, you know, intuitively, I think a lot of people understand and believe that eating a plant-based diet is probably going to be a healthier option in the long term, not only for their kidney, but for many different tissues. But yet there's still this naysayer voice in the back of your head that says, well, the doctor in the lab, white, white lab coat told me that I have to limit, you know, phosphorus, sodium and potassium. Therefore, I just can't do it. It's too dangerous. So the next question I have now is for uh, a patient, let's say that there's a patient who's already undergoing dialysis, okay? They have been doing this for some period of time. It could be a couple of months, maybe it could be a year. Um, if that patient were to start exercising, does exercise, can you use exercise as a tool to come off of dialysis or is that not, is that too aggressive of a statement? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know of any case reports or case series of people being able to reverse, you know, the need for dialysis purely through exercise. And I think it, this is why it's so crucial, right? Especially for those of us who are early in our kidney dysfunction to make meaningful steps now, right? So it's, uh, we like, for example, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's an analogy would be right. Can you amputate someone's toes and they grow back if they eat healthy, you know, et cetera. The answer is no, there is, sometimes is a limit to the recovery of potential of the human body. But do I think that exercise will be of great benefit to the person who is on dialysis? Absolutely, because it will improve their quality of life. It will slow the progression of disability. It will allow them to have greater muscle mass, lean muscle tissue, and able to, to care for themselves and have adventures for years to come. So for example, one of the things that I was um, we brought up briefly earlier is that you know when you think of yourself in five years, 10 years, 20 years, what do you want to be able to do? Do you want to be able to pick up big boxes of books and stuff from your home if you're moving you know, to an apartment? Do you want to be able to move the big planter in the backyard? Do you want to be able to pick up the 40 pound you know, grandchild that you might have one day and throw them around? Who do you want to be? And you have to ask yourself this question is, are the behaviors that you're choosing today creating the person you want to be in five years? Or are you going to hit five years from now and say, dang it, I, I can't even do this. This sucks. Well, it's just because I'm old, right? My grandfather had this great flyer and it said, men and women in your 50s and 60s don't go on the shelf, right? It's not normal to be old at 50 and 60. And that's the reality. But in our society, <coughs> excuse me, we've essentially accepted this abnormality saying that, yeah, when you get 50 and 60, then you're the person who just sits on the porch and watches the other people play and do things. And so it's funny for me, even now, as I approach 50, you know, I am, you know, I have friends over with their kids and I'm the guy out playing tag with the kids in the yard while the other guys are sitting up on the porch, eating and drinking and talking. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't want to sit up there and talk. I want to play, you know, let's go. 
And so, but again, that comes from the effort and the work and the commitment you put in on a daily basis to care for the vehicle. So you've got to ask yourself the question again, do you want dialysis, right? If you don't want dialysis in your life, what are you doing about it now to prevent that? It doesn't matter that you like the taste of haagen It doesn't matter that you like to sit on the couch. It matters what you want in your life in five years and 10 years from now. And very few people, when they're completely honest, will say, yeah, I just want to sit on the couch, watch Netflix without moving, and eat unlimited buckets of haagen and never move again. Like that's not really what most of us wanted when we were kids, nor is it what we want, you know, now. It's not like we're like, ooh, that's my dream life, you know? No, we're like, hey, I'd love to be able to go to Bali or, you know, and check out cool things. I'd love to go to this show. I'd love to go to this performance in Vegas. I'd love to go hike this. Well, that's going to come from hard work. That's the reality. And it's the commitment that we put in every day will create the life that we want long term. And exercise is a huge part of that for your kidney health and for the entire rest of your body. Oh man, so well said. I got goosebumps as you were saying that, honestly, because it was just like it was resonating so hard with me. I think part of the problem, though, if you if you take a look at the the person who's sitting on the couch eating Hagen Dazs and you know corn dogs, um, you know the 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 challenge therein is that when you consume corn dogs and Hagen Dazs and you're watching Netflix for hours at a time, that is a pleasurable experience. That is the problem, right? Because you get good flavors in your mouth. They give you a dopamine release from your brain. You're relaxed. You're watching something funny. It's enjoyable. So it's easy to repeat that behavior over and over and over again because at that moment in time, it leads to a pleasurable experience. But what you're saying is that in the future, it actually is going to lead to a unfavorable set of experiences and a it's going to set you up for an increased rate of chronic disease whether that chronic disease affects your kidney or your liver or your brain or your muscle tissue or anything beyond. So what I keep on telling myself is like, man, I wish, I wish that when we were eating refined foods and, you know, foods that are high in saturated fat and or cholesterol, that we would feel physical pain somewhere in our body. I wish that you could eat that pint of haagen ice cream and you would just feel pain in your kidney instantaneously. Or you would feel pain inside of your brain instantaneously because if you did, chances are you wouldn't repeat that behavior, right? But the problem is that number one, not only do you not experience that pain, number two, you get the opposite of the pain, which is pleasure. And so, of course, you're going to go repeat that behavior because it felt great, right? So um, I love where you – I think the part of the human condition here is that it's really hard to make decisions today that are going to positively benefit you 30 years into the future, right? And it's not impossible to do, but you have to have the right mindset going into it. And you have to make a decision that says, you know what, I'm going to do this right now. It may not feel that comfortable, but that's okay. I'm going to do it because it's going to set me up and create a foundation for success in the short term, but certainly in the long term. Right? So are there any practical things that people can do in your experience that can sort of like help them rewrite this idea that like, you know, this is painful, this is uncomfortable, this isn't good. Like escape the short term and think about the benefits in the long term. How do you do that? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things that can be effective. Um, one of them is to actually sit down, which most people don't want to do this, but this is the first step, and to look at their life right now and play it out, like write out, okay, I'm doing this, this, and this. What is the likelihood of this ending up in such and such place, number one? And looking at it from the 30,000 foot view. Number two, right, is to look at, imagine that you're the CEO of a company. So I tell people, it's time for you to take off the mindset that you're just a leaf and every feel good moment and every pleasure thing that happens and everything that happens in your life just blows you this way and blows you that way. You've got to take on the mindset of a CEO. When a CEO comes into a company that's failing or not doing well, they look around and they, it's not all about emotions. They look around, and they say, look, you know, we're going into the red here. We're losing money because here's why. And they look at this, 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 and this, right? They go, oh, too many stores are open, not enough employees. This person embezzled money here. This happened with that, so on and so forth. And they go, well, my goal as the CEO of this company is to see it thrive. And then they set themselves goals right? The, the, the company needs to make this much money. We need to have this many, blah, blah. Then if this goes well in quarter one, quarter two, we'll hire this many employees, et cetera. Well, the reality is your life and my life is more important than any company, right? That we might ever run or be part of. 
And if we don't care for ourselves in that same way with a real goal, with a vision moving forward, then we're just going to be blown this way and that by the different challenges in our life, right? Oh, we don't have enough money today. Oh my gosh, I'm going to this party over here. Oh, well, I've got this trip. I, I'm totally out of control what I'm going to eat there. And then, that, you know, it's like, I can't exercise next three weeks because of blah, blah. You know, it's like crazy, but we have no plan. So we've got to, first of all, understand a little bit about the choices that we're making, where they're taking us, and then bring on the CEO mentality of, okay, well, how do I change some of these things? And you might even do this. Instead of being personal, like I need to change, you could pretend you're talking to a friend. If your friend was doing the same behaviors that you are, right, and you wanted to help them get healthy, what would you tell them to do? And once you guide them in saying, oh, you write out, oh, well, if it was, you know, Sierra and Sierra told me that her kidney function was down and I just watched Cyrus, this cool guy with his great videos and I'd read his book. Well, I'd tell Sierra all about, you need to do this and this and this, how to put it together and then some exercise on these days, et cetera. And maybe you write out a plan that you would for a friend because sometimes we care more for our friends than we do for ourselves. And then maybe you would you know, be radical and say, well, I'm, I'm actually going to apply this to my life and see what happens for a day, for a week, for three weeks. But when it comes right down to the brass tacks of this, the reality is the thing that's going to make you most successful is the following. You need to make unhealthy food hard to get. And you need to make healthy food easy to get. When you do that, you immediately change the equation. So for example, in my home, the most unhealthy thing that is in my home right now are cashews. So if I want anything that is more unhealthy than cashews, I have to get in my car, I have to drive somewhere, and I have to pay money, or I have to go on some app and have somebody come to my house and whatever. And so that is so uncomfortable for me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to get in my car and I don't want to have to call some random person and pay more money and blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to walk to the fridge and I'm going to eat what's there. And you know what's there? berries and greens and chopped up pineapple and cubes of sweet potatoes that are baked and, and a whole host of other random things. And you know what's in my pantry? A bunch of dates and raisins and figs and you know, um, you know, rice and beans and quinoa and you know, olives, whatever. And so, hey, out of all that stuff, there's going to be something that's the right tone, the right flavor, the right texture in the moment that I'm going to grab and I'm going to you know, put in my mouth and my body will be like, oh, okay, fine. We're good. Moving on. You know, where's the book that you're going to read? Where's the, what, what are you going to do with the kids? What, what article do you have to write? What studies are you doing over here? You know, that sort of thing and move on to the next task. And so we need to make sure that we make it extraordinarily difficult to get healthy food. So the people who say to me when I go, they're like, oh, I'm still struggling with the chips. I'm like, why are there chips in your house? Like there, there's not even a conversation here. Why are there chips in your house? Why is there still chocolate milk in your house? Because if it's still in your house, you're not serious. Now, if you've got family members who refuse to adopt a healthy program with you, here's what you do. Number one, you, you first of all, you need to tell them you love them, you care about them, and they're really bad people. And why do they hate you so much? No, I'm just kidding. But you can bring a little bit of leverage to, <laughs> to this situation and, you know, and make them know that they're, they're going to kill you slowly. No, I'm just kidding. But you, know, you can have some of those conversations. But the reality is what you need to do is you need to have a separate area for your food. So if they absolutely refuse to change the behavior, number one, you either just have a you know drawer and a, and a level in the fridge that has it's blinged out. It has fun little signs from you that say, yeah, rock stars food, right, or whatever. And that's your food, the healthy girl's food right here, you know, all in pink with little arrows, et cetera. And that's what you eat. You know, if you can afford it and have room for it, well, then have your own refrigerator in the garage, right? Or right next to the other fridge. Uh, you know, so when I was in medical school, I had a house and I rented all the rooms out to a bunch of roommates and I had one fridge that was theirs and I had my fridge right next to it. I had two fridges in the kitchen, right? And I would fill mine with all this produce and wholesale stuff, et cetera. And then they started all eating out of my produce anyway. They loved it. But the whole idea here is you need to have your area. And if in the pantry or the cupboards, you've got some, you know, sort of racks, et cetera, that you say, this is my food, right? This is my area. Because we need to change up in here that it's, no, there, there's real food that's meant for you. And then there's food-like substances of abuse. Two different things. This is brilliant, actually, because what you're saying is that you're going to make the tasty but yet knowingly unhealthy food hard to access. You're going to have to work for it, right? It's not in your house. It's at the grocery store. It's at a convenience store. It's at a pizza parlor. But you have to exert a lot of work in order to get into your car, in order to get over there, to purchase it using your credit card. 
And, you know, you're not going to go, chances are you're going to be like, you know, I don't freaking care. I don't really care that much anymore. I'm just going to eat this quinoa, right? But um, correct me if I'm wrong, for somebody that's sort of maybe newer to this or struggling with the transition from a standard American diet to eating this way, let's say they cleaned out their pantry and they cleaned out their fridge and just following your instructions and they're like, yeah, that Stefan guy, I love that guy. He's my new guru. Sounds great. I'm going to do exactly what he says. And then they are now in this environment that's like impeccably clean because the most unhealthy thing that they have are cashews, just like you said. But then they start eating this food and they're just like, oh man, this stuff is boring. I don't like this stuff. It doesn't have like, where's the flavor? Where's the enjoyment from this food, right? I don't want to eat more freaking quinoa. I don't eat more freaking black beans, right? This stuff's not tasty, right? What do you say to that person? Because that person can ultimately revert back to their previous habits and then say, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to get that pizza or that Thai food because it's got a lot of salt, oil, and sugar. And man, my brain loves that stuff. So I'd say three things. Number one is you deserve to eat food that loves you back. Number two, I would say you should make a commitment to do this for four to six weeks, 100% and see what happens, how you feel, what happens with your blood sugars, what happens with your energy, et cetera. Number three, I would say there's something that's really good news. And that is that your body adapts to change over time. So for example, the amount of dopamine that used to be released by Mickey D's fries, you can actually get pretty close to that release over time when you begin to eat some baked sweet potato fries, a little bit of ketchup on it, et cetera. Once you are six months, 12 months, let's say, out from eating the unhealthy food. Now, some things truly have an orgasmic effect and they're intended for that purpose to addict you, right? So there's this sort of, you know, release of dopamine that occurs with these food-like substances of abuse that have been created in chemical laboratories in order to create this massive dopamine release, almost like crack cocaine in your brain. And you won't achieve that same level through the consumption of minimally processed whole foods. But your body does become more efficient at providing endorphin responses to healthy food the longer that you eat the healthy food. So for example, you know, that person who's addicted to opioids, when they start getting off the opioids, at first there's like, there's no joy in life. There's nothing fun here. Nothing is giving me any real endorphin effect. Yet when they've been on it for days, weeks, months, and years, now the beautiful sun rises, the warm sexual intimacy, the spiritual reading, the deep breathing and meditation, the exercise actually begins to release nice quantities of endorphins and opioids endogenous opioids in the bloodstream. But when you're on the chronic opioids, right, you don't release that same level of pleasurable hormones and as a result of the other activities you do. And that's why you're, you go back to the opioids. Well, that's the same concept with these food-like substances of addiction, right? So these heavily processed white flour, white sugar, oil, et cetera, foods, these foods release massive quantities of dopamine in the brain and they get you addicted. But as you begin to get away from those foods, there's a neurologic adaptation where now when you consume that medjool date with that sweet, juicy mango, it actually explodes with dopamine in your brain and you get this amazing feeling of, of that same feeling that you had with some of the unhealthy foods, but yet your food is loving you back rather than compromising your health. You've got to remember something. If you are eating the standard American diet, you are in an abusive relationship. You are, you're, you're stuck. You're like, oh, I need to eat this. I want to eat this. I want to get away from it. And yet it feels good in the moment, but yet that person is beating you in the face and leaving you bloodied and damaged. You deserve better than that. You've got to remember that. Your body was intended for healthy food and movement on a regular basis. When you don't give it what it needs, deserves, and wants, you end up abusing it. And you don't deserve that. So number one, be patient with yourself. Number two, set a plan. Number three, have support. That's where the guys and girls in Mastering Diabetes, your program, are so effective at helping guide people through this process, right? So the coaches that you have who can help people when they are struggling, and that's the beauty of what you offer, right? If they don't want to do that, they can do my simple four or six-week program, right? Download a thing and follow it 100%. But having the live real person that you guys have and the, all that that you offer is outstanding.
And that's what they should be doing if they know that they themselves struggle. Again, if you've got the CEO mentality, you're going to say, I don't have to do this on my own. I need help. I know I'm that kind of person. This is going to be tough for me the first four to six weeks. Let me get some support because I'm going to have tons of questions and I need that. But that's a CEO mentality. That's not a little kid's mentality. And that's not a leaf in the wind mentality, right? And to be a winner in the health game, you need to be willing to be honest with yourself. And I hate to say this, but you also have to demonstrate some of the D word, some discipline. And that can be uncomfortable for a lot of people and makes them squirmy. But the reality is that discipline on a daily basis that is going to help you be successful in every aspect of your life, but especially in the health game. This is this is mind blowing actually, because as you're talking about this, I'm thinking to myself like, man, how do you adopt the CEO mentality when it comes to running your life, right? Your life is a business. And now you're basically the CEO that's going to oversee everything, all of the inputs, all of the outputs, and you're going to take responsibility for things when they either go right or when they go wrong. And when you adopt it from that mindset, I mean, it's a complete game changer, right? Because that way you're not, you, your goal is to try and optimize your health and try and try and get more out, you know, not necessarily get more inputs, but get more outputs for less inputs. And uh, it's a completely different way of thinking about human health. So like, I personally have never thought about my body as, you know, or, or myself as the CEO of my own body. But I'm telling you, after this conversation, I'm going to start to view every single thing that I do as though I'm a CEO and you just gave me a massive epiphany. So uh, that's a really, really powerful thing that our listeners can take away from today. Yeah. I mean, it's been an interesting dynamic change for me because growing up as a kid at Esser's Ranch, right? It was expected that I would eat a certain way, exercise a certain way, act a certain way. And so just like many youth, there was that mindset of, Whoa, I want to sneak the chocolate bar behind the thing, or oh, I'm at a church event, I'm gonna have a piece of pizza, or I'm gonna sneak this over here or do that, right? Try to push the boundaries a little bit. And as I began to get older, I began to realize that I was like, but why? That's such an adolescent mindset. That's not somebody who actually is the steward of the place. Versus if I take on the mindset of that I am being paid to care for this property, I'm a steward of it, right? This old school mentality, this old world mentality of I'm a steward, I'm being paid to care for this place, right? Well, that's a totally different mindset than if I think I'm a renter, right? If I'm just a renter, we'll trash the place, man, who cares? You know, I rented the car, let me just gun it down the road, do some, you know, who cares, right? Yeah, do some donuts, right? You know, but the reality is you're not a renter. You are a steward. You are an owner, right? You know, and it's it's like it's fascinating for us to think about this. And so, as I've become older, I've realized what is this? Like, oh, I want the cheese pizza. It's like, what do you mean you want the cheese pizza? No, you don't. You're, what you're really saying is you want that emotional high. You want that dopamine feel, but you don't want the toxicity that comes with it. You don't want the disease that increases with it. You don't want the impaired insulin sensitivity that comes with it. And so you've got to start waking up and say, no, what you really want is that joyful dopaminergic feeling. Okay, well, guess what? Can you go get a hug from your wife? Can you go have some physical intimacy with your significant other? Can you go for a run or a jog or workout and get some endorphins? Can you go do some spiritual reading and deep meditation? Because that's going to give you that same dopaminergic feeling, yet it's going to have a therapeutic positive effect on your life and on your relationships. Very different mindset. So when I've been able to start stripping away this sort of like little adolescent, like, wah, wah, I want to do it my way. And instead of saying, no, I am a steward. I am powerful in my, in my life. I am a CEO of this company and I want it to be successful. Oh my gosh. Now I can go to a gathering where there are all kinds of desserts and things like that. And I can literally sit there and just eat some strawberries and be happy as a lark and chatting with all the people and being goofy and dancing and having a great time. Or I can go to that big dance party, right? And I can just grab the non-alcoholic water, right? And chug it down and dance like a fool and not care and have a great time and not be sitting there going, oh, I wish I could have. Oh, if only I was allowed. And it's like, what are you talking about? You can have whatever you want, but it has effects on the bottom line with regards to your health company. And what do you really want? right? What do you really want? And that's what we've all got to really ask ourselves that question. And so that's, yeah, I'm glad that's been of some value. This has negative effects on the bottom line of your health company. That is some powerful, powerful words right there. I absolutely love this. And it's, it's a really, it's a different mindset. Like you're saying, you know, if you're a renter, okay, fine, great. Uh, you know, take my security deposit. I don't even care. I'm going to leave this hole in the wall. 
I'm out. This is your responsibility versus no, I'm the owner. I got to upkeep this entire property to make sure that the bushes look good and the trees look good and the roof is in a good condition and the windows are clean and the door is proper and the couch is clean. You name it, right? Completely different mentality. You actually take full ownership over it. And uh, I wish people did follow your advice more because uh, it, it has such a profound effect on your uh, emotional well-being and your mental well-being when you decide that you're going to be very intentional about what you put into your mouth. And I think that that's something that people just don't have any experience with, right? People don't, people don't know what they don't know. They don't know that if they start to eat a more healthful diet, if they start to move their body more frequently, that they will actually become a more emotionally happy individual and they will have better emotional resilience they will have improved cognitive ability into the later years in their life. They literally don't know that. And so once they start to recognize that and start to learn the science and learn from people like you who are absolutely like incredibly well-read and very eloquent, then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, light bulb. What I'm doing today is actually going to help me in many aspects of my overall life. And it's not just about getting my blood glucose to get lower. Okay, fine. That's one biomarker that might improve. But guess what? There's literally a thousand other positive benefits that come along for the ride. Wow. I didn't know that. It's pretty powerful stuff. Love it. Well, and I'd, I'd encourage your viewers, right? Commit to four weeks of following you know, your programs right, and exercising daily and see what happens. See how you feel, give it 100% and see what happens. Tell me this, how can people become super fans of you like me? Where are they gonna find you online? Are you on TikTok? Are you on Instagram? Are you on Snapchat? Where are they gonna find you? That's right, so Esser Health or is probably the best uh, handle to use kind of on Instagram and Facebook is where I'm most commonly found and would be delighted to continue to share my passion with anybody who wants to hang out. Fantastic. So you have two different websites, correct? You have EsserHealth.com and EsserSports.com, if I'm not mistaken, right? That That is correct. Yep. And the Esser Health is more about healthy living, lifestyle, well-being. And the Esser Sports is my day-to-day -day kind of practice, which involves the combination of lifestyle interventions and then also kind of cutting edge biologic techniques uh, for sports medicine issues. Fantastic. And um, where is your clinic located? What part of the country? Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida. Okay, great. So do you, if somebody decides that they really love your philosophy, maybe they want to do a consultation with you, they want to come to your clinic, uh, explain, do you only work with people uh, in person? Do you have any telehealth services to come along with the ride? Kind of give us an overview, brag about yourself a little bit and tell people how they can directly interact with you. So for always happy to help how we can. So for true um, medical needs, I uh, you know, offer both in-person and teleconsults for people in Florida. For people who want to do lifestyle consults, meaning talking about exercise, just, you know, uh, new, a little nutrition, stuff like that, and people can book a lifestyle medicine consult on essersports.com. Happy to do that from anywhere in the world. Uh, I also offer, we offer a juice bungalow where people can come and stay for in a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house um, and make fresh squeezed organic juices. And I give them a little lecture every day and, you know, exercise with my wife, et cetera. And then we also offer an online program. Actually, we have one that's about to go live in March. That'll be a two-month program that'll involve, you know, uh, Zoom calls with me twice a week and exercise programs and some cooking demos and all kinds of fun stuff. So all of that will be uh, available on EsserHealth.com and or EsserSports.com. Amazing. You are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This is uh, episode one of multiple episodes. We're going to be talking about a lot more uh, topics here within the sports world, but Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, giving us so much inspiration and uh, we will catch you next time.